welcome, good evening. And uh, as you might have uh, already surmised, uh, Pastor Glenn is not teaching this evening. He's on a well-deserved vacation, albeit a brief one, and so this week I'm subbing for him. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to relax, take it easy, and just be real mellow tonight. What do you think? Um, let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us this day. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, for your compassion, for everything you've done for us, for which we can never thank you enough. Thank you for everything, for every good thing that cometh from above, from the Father of lights, in who is no shadow, or no darkness or shadow of turning. We thank you. We thank you for lighting up our lives and helping us to see your glory. And we thank you for it. Touch each and every uh, classroom tonight. Touch the people who have gathered here, the children who have gathered here. Let your word go forth. Let the praise and worship go forth. And let everything be done according to your purpose. We bind any spirit that would try to hinder or to attack or to in any way uh, to in a way interfere with the flowing of your spirit. Lord, have your way with me, and we'll give you the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about um, two characters that basically give a whole new meaning to the term sibling rivalry. Okay, sibling rivalry. Uh, for anybody who has siblings, brothers and sisters, you know, that dynamic can be really interesting, but uh, leave it to Bible characters to take it to a whole new level. So we're going to talk tonight about Jacob and Esau. So if you will turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25, while you're turning there, in uh, chapter... 23, there was the passing of uh, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and in Genesis 24, goes on to recount the story of how Abraham sent forth his servant and basically acquired a wife for his son Isaac. And um, then in uh, chapter 25, where we're going to begin tonight, at first it begins by talking about Abram's uh, second marriage to his wife Keturah and the children of, of uh, Abraham by her and his passing in uh, verse 8 and how he was buried by his sons Isaac and Ishmael in verse 9 and, and then it says in verse 11 it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahorai and then it talks about the generations of Ishmael and so when you get back to verse 19 it talks about verse 19 and these are the generations of Isaac Abraham's son Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padanaram the sister to Laban the Syrian and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. So we see here Isaac and Rebekah entreated the Lord for a child, and the pregnancy was getting interesting, so she goes to ask, why in the world is my pregnancy like this? And so she inquires, and in verse 23, and the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. 
and the first came out red all over and, and like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. <laughs> that must... <laughs> I find that interesting. I mean, you don't usually think of Middle Easterners as red-haired. You know what I mean? Um, that, that's not one of those things. You usually think about dark complexion, dark hair. But Esau comes out, and he is red all over. He's, he's reddish-skinned. He's reddish-haired. And he is hairy all over. Usually, you don't come out like, let's be honest, I, I've seen children, you know, newborn children, you don't usually find them basically fully furry, <laughs> okay? <laughs> let's, 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 <laughs> but, but, but Edom comes out there basically wearing a fur coat, you know, and, 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 and so he ends up naturally, you know, it's one of those things. He comes out and it's like, well, this is how he looks. We're basically, <laughs> we're going to call him Esau. And he also ends up picking up the names, uh, a nickname of Edom, which means red. Esau refers to him being hairy, okay? You know, this is hardly a, an original thought. He comes out, he's hairy, so we're going to refer to him by a word that means hairy. And then he comes out and he's red all over, and so his nickname is going to basically connotate the fact that he's red. You know, this is hardly genius, but it, it's rather obvious, but you, it comes to, um, it comes to uh, give us an understanding of a little bit about this, this guy. It says, after that, his brother comes out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. And the reason that he's called Jacob is because the word Jacob, the name Jacob has the connotation of heel. And because it's the basis of a verb that uh, basically you're trying to catch it, you're essentially a heel catcher. Okay? And there's another connotation to this name, this heel catcher phrase. If you look at it in, in, in a pictorial light, the term Jacob is like somebody who, it, it has the uh, connotation of trickster. That's why you'll hear people who talk about Jacob. They always talk about Jacob is a con man. Jacob is a trickster. Jacob is, you know, uh, what his brother later calls him, a supplanter. Okay? He's the guy basically who trips you in the race to get ahead. Okay? He doesn't mind, you know... Uh, taking a shortcut to, to get what he wants. At least that's how he's usually uh, portrayed, and with some, with some justification. But it says that they called his name Jacob, and Isaac was three score years old when she buried them, so he was essentially 60 years old. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And this is what I find really interesting. You got two different kind of guys here. Two different kind of guys. And since there's nothing new under the sun, and people don't generally change, I've seen these two guys before, okay? There's Esau. He's the hunter. He's the outdoorsman. He's the man of action, okay? And then you have, you have Jacob. Jacob dwells in the tents. It says he's a plain man, but the interesting thing is, if you look at that word that's translated there, plain, it's actually used in other portions of Scripture for perfect. He's actually a very good person. His actual behavior is not like we're often told about Jacob that he's constantly up to something, that he's constantly looking to do some dirt. In fact, the connotation here is that he is living a very righteous, holy, upright life, okay? Now, we're actually told 
in Scripture that in Hebrews chapter 12, um, verse uh, 15, that basically Esau is a very immoral man. In fact, he's a very unholy man. Okay? So you got these two different kind of guys. But though they're different in their character, they also sort of sum up two other different kinds of guys that I've run into. And that is simply this. You have the more athletic, outdoorsy Esau, and then you have the more studious, indoor Jacob. And these guys break down into two categories, jocks and geeks, okay? Jocks and geeks. We all know this particular dichotomy, okay? Anybody who went through high school knows. You've got your jocks and you've got your geeks, okay? And do, how well do they get along, okay? Do, do the jocks and the geeks mix at the same table in the cafeteria? No. No. Do they hang out at the same places? No. No, no. The geeks are at the comic book shop, okay? The, 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 the jocks are at the locker room. These are not two compatible personalities, okay? And so you have these, these two different, uh, markedly different uh, type of people. Now, the thing about it is the boys grow, okay, and, it's, and, and there's a division in the house. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, there's, your gonna, there's, there's the beginnings of trouble right there because each of the children has become the favorite of a different parent. Okay, first of all, picking favorites in a family is always bad policy. Okay. That's always a bad policy. And when you have one fa uh, uh, parent favoring one and another one favoring the other, then you're going to have some real interesting times. So Rebecca is favoring, is favoring her indoorsy son. Esau likes his outdoorsy son. And I, can get, I, I get that because that's a typical male mentality, by the way. Let's be honest. Men, we like action. You know, we got that schoolhouse rock thing. I did my thing in action, verb. That's what's happening. No, everybody understands. We're all about, we like to watch action films. I don't want to watch a documentary on Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was a great inventor. He was a great thinker. Boring. You know, it's like, can we turn on a, a Marvel movie? Maybe something with Schwarzenegger in it. I want to see some action here. You know, is there a ball game on? Okay, can I get some action? And so we have this, uh, this thing about uh, we like action, you know? And when you're pitching to males, you pitch to that. Women have a slightly different mentality. As you might have noticed, women do think differently than men. There is a rumor, okay? And she's not so impressed with her outdoorsy athletic firstborn Esau, but she's very fond of the indoorsy, more cerebral, more thoughtful, reflective son, Jacob. And another reason that she is different from her approach in, in this regard is she remembers the word of the Lord concerning her two sons. Two kinds of people in there, two nations at struggle. The elder shall serve the younger. But Isaac loves the venison that his son Esau brings him. So Esau brings daddy what he likes, and he's daddy's favorite. Now, the problem with that is daddy lets that get in the way of God. And that's a bad thing to do. It says here, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. 
Now, this is just after we're told Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. So Jacob is making some pottage, lentils, actually, and Esau comes from the field, and it says he was faint, okay? And Esau says to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, okay? And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright, okay? Now, here's something you got to understand about Esau. Esau is a, tends to be a little bit emotional. When you read about the reconciliation between Esau and uh, Jacob, when Jacob's coming back with his family from Padanaram, after he's wrestling with the angel and he has this, this, uh, this reunion with the brother he fears, Esau's the emotional one. Read that. Read that that portion of scripture. Esau's the emotional one. And here he is again being the emotional one. It's like, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Now, let's be honest. You might think the man is something of a drama king. Okay? Esau might be a drama king. And normally I'd say that, and, and to some extent it's true because he's definitely more emotional, more high-strung than Jacob, who's sitting there, really, care to make a deal? Just how hungry are you, brother? The more cerebral Jacob is like, okay, just how hungry are you? Just how hungry are you? And this is where we're going to get into some real funny games. See, he talks about being faint. Well, one of the things that is, is interesting is when I start doing this, I start studying the, um, the Jewish traditions around these characters. And there's an interesting little story that's uh, not in the Bible, but I thought it was an interesting read anyway. And that is the tradition that basically when... Esau went on his hunting trip that day, and he comes back and he's talking about how faint he is, is that he should have been exhausted because he committed three murders and a theft that very same day. Now, that, <laughs> that'll wear a body out. Somebody had a busy day. And in fact, according to the Jewish, uh, the Hebrew sages, what they tell you is that basically he went out and he killed a man named Nimrod. And the reason he killed a man named Nimrod was because Nimrod had a, per, a, a special garment, one that traces all the way back to Adam, and he wanted it. And so basically he killed Nimrod to get it because Nimrod was, as the scripture tells us, a mighty hunter before the Lord, and he tended to like to go out on hunting trips and uh, according to the story, uh, Esau saw Nimrod, saw his opportunity, decapitated him, stole his garment, and then had to fight two of his guards who had discovered the murder. This is a busy day's work. So, one can, so, so if that legend has any truth to it, and it is widely believed by the Jewish people that it does, then one can certainly understand why he would have been in something of a state of exhaustion when he came staggering in there wanting something to eat. Because if he had simply been on a hunting trip, it seems rather unlikely that such a good hunter would have come back empty-handed. Well, the thing about it is you have to remember we're not told, like I say, and like I say, this is the thing. These are the beliefs of the Jewish people. However, it does make one wonder because when you study out the word that he uses for faint, there's actually a correlation between that particular word faint and the word murder in the Hebrew. And isn't that interesting? But whether, he, whether you choose to believe that he did that or not. He certainly had reason 
to have shown up in a rather disheveled, exhausted, and desperate condition. Now, what does this tell us about our boy Esau? Well, it tells us a lot. Because later in his history, Esau is going to go to a place called Mount Seir. And he's going to take and displace a people called the Horites by the sword. And he's going to take that territory as his own. And so this is a man who has no problem taking what he wants by violent means. This is not a man who has any problem taking you out. So when later on he threatens his brother's life, Jacob has no doubt that his brother is completely capable of making good on his promise. Now here's the thing. Everybody is busting on Jacob, the con man, the trickster. But he has just made him a flat out business proposition. It's like, listen brother, you ain't dying. You ain't gonna drop dead. Whatever dirt you've been up to today, I got a deal for you. Your birthright for these lentils, straight up. Now, old Esau basically says, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pie, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Straight up business deal. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did ink, eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now in doing so, he's doing something really stupid. First of all, the birthright, when you are the firstborn, you receive a double portion of all that your father had. That's the inheritance that goes with being the firstborn, okay? As the firstborn, if there is a God covenant promise to your father, you are automatically the inheritor of it. And God had already promised Abraham that there's, his descendants would be as the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea for multitude, that the land on which they dwelt, he would give it to him, and that kings would come forth from him. And in him, Abraham, should will all the earth be blessed. That is the messianic promise of Jesus Christ. And that promise, as you will look one chapter ahead if you want to read it in chapter 26, where he speaks it again, this time, to Isaac, okay? And it says here, let me see here. And the Lord appeared unto him, verse 2, and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tear thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee, and for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy, thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. It's short, from your father Abraham to you, Isaac, 
I have made this promise. And as the holder of the birthright, those promises and those blessings were part and parcel now of what, uh, of what Isaac had and what Jacob stood to gain. So when Esau despised his birthright, he despised all that. Genius. But Esau doesn't seem to get that. And Isaac, Isaac's going to do something remarkably foolish. Because Esau doesn't really care about the birthright. Okay? Esau is more about the moment. He's not worried about his descendants. He's not worried about being a, a messianic blessing. He's not worried about all of that. He's for the moment. Okay? And so it talks about, and there's this in uh, 26, there's the side trip and the story concerning Abimelech. But it gets back to Isaac and Esau in verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which are a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Okay. So here we're seeing a little more about our our boy Esau. He not only has a violent side, but he has already went against God's ordained pattern in that he is seeking a wife not from his own, but from the pagans that are around him. Now, this is one of those things that's basically referred to in Hebrews chapter 12, verse verse 15, where it talks about him being sexually immoral, don't be sexually immoral or unholy like Isaac, uh, pardon me, like, uh, like Esau. And so what he's doing is he's telling you, don't be running after women you don't need to be running after. So Esau has a problem. He has a problem in that he's always heading in the wrong direction with the wrong motives for the wrong goals. But here's where things get really fun. In chapter 27, it says, It came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son... And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the, the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to want to pause there for a moment. In the first verse, we're told that Isaac had grown old and his eyes were dim. And he wanted to play this blessing on his son because he felt that his time was running short. He actually was going to live another 20 years. Bit of drama king there. But he decided, I'm going to bless my son before I die. Now, here's the problem. God had already said that the older would serve the younger, and 
I, and Isaac was going against God's express purpose in that the birthright had already been sold. And with it goes the blessing. He was about to basically cross God's line. Now Esau goes out to hunt the venison because dear old dad likes the taste of it. I, Isaac needed to watch out. You know the problem is just because it blesses your tongue, don't let your tongue bless it. If it's not good and it's not right and it's not God's, it doesn't matter how good it feels to your tongue, don't let your tongue bless it. And by this time, he's already grown dim in his eyesight. But you know, the thing about it is, that dimness of eyesight's going to be his undoing because his plan's about to fall apart. In verse 9, his mother, Jacob's mother says, listen to me and do what I command thee. Go now to the flock, fetch from me thence two goats, two kids of the goats, and I will make them savor meat for thy father, such as he loveth, and thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said to him, Upon me be thy curse. My son, only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made a savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her son, eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kins of the goats upon his hands and upon the smoothness of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. Well, that's quite a little plot there. You know, we really don't talk about Rebecca much. But when we start talking about Jacob's later life and how he interacts with Rebecca's brother, Laban, Laban's quite a trickster himself. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to conspiracy, apparently Laban's sister Rebecca is every bit as shrewd in the how to hatch a plot as her brother Laban is. And she's already telling her son, look, whatever, if this thing goes sideways, it's all on me. Let God take care of this. It's like, let it all fall on me. You know what? He may have obeyed his mother. She may have said those words, but at the end of the day, it wasn't Rebecca that God held accountable. It was Jacob. How do I know this? Well, when we, let, let's read the narrative a little farther. He come unto his father, and he says, My father, and he says, Here am I, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it thou art found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may, may feel thee, my son, whether or not the, the, this be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went unto Esau, Isaac his father, and he felt him, and he said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, as his brother's Esau hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, 
and he drank. And then he comes and he kisses, has his son kiss him, and then he begins to relate the blessing that God will bring upon him for what he has done. And he talks about the fullness of the field and those who will serve him. But here's the thing about Isaac. His eyes grew dim, but his ear had not. But the problem with him was he had lost, the, his, he had lost not only had he lost his physical sight, but he had lost his spiritual sight. Because if he had not lost his spiritual sight, he would have never, never chosen to bless Esau instead of Isaac, or instead of uh, Jacob. And he was completely confused by the fact that I can't see you, but I hear your voice, and it's Jacob, and I feel your hands, and it's Esau. But at the end of the day, he fell into the trap that too many people fall into. Don't go by what you feel. Go by what you, whose voice you've heard. It's about the voice you've heard, not what you felt. And too many people go by their feelings and not by the voice. And we need to understand that in the days to come, we better be listening and discerning whose voice we're hearing because feelings, well, we see what happened. So he blesses him. Now, this has been a put-up job. Jacob obeyed his mother, but his mother was not held responsible for this. So what happened here? Let's see. Well, let's see. Um, because his, his father couldn't see, Jacob was able to trick his father Isaac into giving him the blessing. Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty raw. I mean, yes, he was due the blessing, but he was going about in the wrong way. Now, the scripture tells us, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will be able to assuredly reap. So, when he was passing himself off as somebody he wasn't, to his father that could not see him, he didn't realize that in about seven years, he was going to be somewhere he couldn't see in a dark tent, and somebody was going to pass themselves off as somebody other than who they, he thought they were going to be. But in the light of day, he was going to find out that just as his father found out, wait a minute, I just blessed Jacob instead of Esau. He was going to come out of the tent and find out, I just slept with Leah instead of Rachel. And he was going to earn seven more years of work for that. Payback. You do reap what you sow. Not only that, now I'm not going to go into all that. There are at least four different ways in which that situation came back to roost in, in Jacob's life, including the fact that he deceived his own father. And later in life, his children would conspire to deceive him. When they bring... <laughs> How did he deceive his father? 
he used a goat skin. Later in life, several of his sons were going to use a goat skin. You see the you see you see the blood of the, you see the blood on this on this on this coat of our brother. Surely he is dead. What was it? It was a goat's blood that they killed. He used a goat to deceive his father. His children would use a goat to deceive him. What goes around comes around. Because no matter what people tell you, what you do comes back on you. Nobody else gets to step in. There's only one person who's ever been able to step in and take my place concerning my sin. Nobody else can step in and take our place concerning our sin but Christ. And then Isaac, Isaac may have been fooled, but at the end of the day, Jacob was going to reap the same thing. Now, what I want to talk to you about here is he gave him the blessing he was already due to. But it goes back to this thing of it never would have happened if Esau had never sold the birthright in the first place. There are two moments recorded here, the birthright and the blessing, and both of them were going to come back on the person that made a decision. First was Esau, second was Jacob. Jacob was going to suffer his. There are things we decide in life to do that we are going to pay for the rest of our lives. Anybody ever made a choice? And you made it in the moment, and it seemed like a good idea? You know, that's the thing about Esau. He is so impulsive. In that moment, he actually thought, it doesn't matter that I sell this birthright. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what I can get this second. As I look around, what I see and what God keeps dealing with me is there are people right now who do not realize that they have made decisions that they are about to make decisions that are going to affect their lives and the lives of others, not just this moment, but for the rest of their lives. And people need to consider the choices that they have made and that they're about to make. Choices matter. Choices matter. Esau's choice to sell his birthright mattered. Jacob's decision to listen to his mother and take the, bir the blessing in a way that he should never have done, that, that was going to haunt him the rest of his life at least for the next 20 years that he was going to spend hiding in Padanaram because as soon as his brother finds out what he's done, I'm going to kill him. That's good, for, that's good for family relations. So his mother says, you need, to go, you need to go get a wife. You need to go see my brother. You need to go hang in Padanaram. He never saw his mother's face again. She had passed away by the time he came back 20 years later. What did Rebecca reap? 
what did Rebecca reap? She never saw her son again. What the Lord keeps impressing upon me is the choices we make. Right now, we are in positions where we are focused. Our focus is being pushed on the wrong things. Esau's focus was on something else other than what it should have been. His priority should have been the birthright. His priority should have been the call of God. His priority should have been obedience to God. But it wasn't. It was his momentary pleasure. And right now, we have multitudes of people, especially here but all around the world, who are missing their birthright, missing their blessing, missing their calling, missing their anointing, missing their moment because they're focused on the wrong thing at this time. They're missing it because they're too busy. I, I, I missed my moment because I got a text. I missed my moment because the phone rang. I mixed my moment because I was focused on my television program. I missed my moment because there was an event happening. There was this thing happening. There was that thing happening. There was the other thing happening. And the problem is what we have is a multitude of shiny objects that are being waved in front of our eyes. And like Esau, all we can do is see the moment and we miss the, bl the blessing of the long term. It, we, have a, we have multitudes of people that are going down the Esau path. They are going down the Esau path. And then what we have are the Esau, are the Jacobs, who believe, who are actually, you know, the birthright was his. He got it the right way. It was, it was a straight up deal. But he deceived for the blessing. And the thing about it is this. The thing about it is this. The ends do not justify the means. But right now, what we have a lot of people who are saying, I know, <sighs> you can do it God's way or you can do it your way. But your way, you're going to pay a price for it. If you do it God's way, he's already paid the price for it. What Jacob did he was going to pay the price for the rest of his life. Never seeing his mother again. Living 20 years in fear of his brother. Being deceived by his own children. Being deceived by his own wife. Being deceived by his father-in-law. But you know the problem is, one of the things that I... See, the problem is Esau is a whole lot like the people out there. Jacob's a lot like the people in the church. Because one of the things that I am finding is a terrible attitude among people inside the churches is, I'll do what I want and I'll stick God's name on it. And the ends justify the means. And it doesn't matter how wrong it is. Apparently, y'all ain't been in the same church as I've been. Just saying. Uh, I know my experiences are, of course, a unique one. But let me tell you something. 
The ends never justify the means. No matter what you think, God doesn't need your help. God didn't need Rebecca's help to bring that blessing to her son. And God didn't need those goat skins and Jacob's deception of his father to bring that blessing on him. And God doesn't need any help to fulfill your purpose or my purpose or our purpose. God is fully capable of taking care of his own business in his own way, in his own time, for his own glory, that no flesh might glory in his presence. We need him. He don't need us. He's capable of doing it all by himself. And if he has to pick up you and you and you and me and put us all on his back and carry us to our destiny in him, then he will do it again because he did it before when he took up a cross and he walked up a hill and he sat there and for all of us he took our place because he can do it himself he did it himself before he'll do it himself if he has to now we need him he will get the job done it's our job to trust in him and to believe in him and watch as he brings the blessing of the birthright of the firstborn on each of us who are called by his name mm. for 20 years jacob ran from the deception he pulled on his father. He hid in fear. And when the day came that he came, he knew he was coming back home. He went off by himself. Because you know what? You can tell yourself the ends justify the means. But let me tell you something. If you've done dirt, you can lie all day long. You can lie to your friends, and you can lie to your family, and you can lie to your coworkers, and you can lie to your, but somewhere in your heart, you're going to know what I did I shouldn't have done. And I know it. And one day I've got to go back and I've got to confront it. And so he had to go back. And he had, after 20 years, to say, Hi, brother. Lord, help us if God makes everybody in the church start going back to the people they've wronged in the church and then the people they've wronged that are no longer in the church, we'll have lines like you ain't going to believe if we start trying to make things right. God brought him to a place and he's terrified of his brother so he's setting up he's setting up it's like I'll send I'll send him some gifts and I'll and I'll put this group of my family here and I'll put this group of my family there and I and I'll be at the very back cuz I'm going to I'm going to see how this goes I need to I'm going to I got to see my brother tomorrow and I need to check the temperature in the room and he's got 400 with him but tonight Tonight, I got to go, I got to go off and I got to be by myself. Because when I ran from my brother, he told me when I stopped to rest and I laid down my head, I looked up and there was a place where I saw angels ascending and descending and 
I didn't know that I was basically right there in, in the house of God. And he promised he would take care of me all the days of my life. Well, you know, it was a promise I didn't have to deceive anybody for. But now I'm here alone, and I don't know if tomorrow is going to be the last day of my life when I see my brother again. And he goes off by himself. And suddenly he sees a man. And the man approaches him and begins to wrestle with him. You know, I may think of God in many ways. I may think of the Lord in many ways. But I don't necessarily acquaint wrestling as one of them. You know, I don't think the Lord came down there like like the WWE and cut a promo on him <laughs> and told him, <laughs> Jacob, you done some dirt, and I want you to know, here on this very mount, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to lay the smack on you. You know, I'm going to lay the smack down on you. And, and I was like, No. No, I'm come to do tonight what I've been doing with you for 20 years that you've been running from. I'm here to wrestle with you. I'm here to wrestle with you, Jacob. You've been running a long time, and I've blessed you, and I've kept you, just like I said I would. But you're going to have to deal with your past you're going to have to deal with your baggage. You've got to deal with your family. You've got to deal with stuff that you don't want to deal with anymore. But before you can, we're going to wrestle. And he wrestled with Jacob all night long. He wrestled with him all night long. And as the day was about to break, he wrestled with Jacob and he told him, now you need to let me go because the day is breaking. And, he, and at this point, there's a shift because he says, no, I will not let you go. Can I tell you, that was a shift because up till then, God was wrestling with Jacob. But something changed, and now it was Jacob who was wrestling with God. God has been wrestling with some of us for a very long time because it was the only time that he, only way he could finally bring us to wrestle with him. He reached down and he touched him in the hollow of his, of his thigh, right where the thigh bone connects to the hip. And it dislocated his leg and it caused that, that tendon to shrivel. But he wouldn't let him go. And he said, I will not let, I will wrestle with you, and I will hold on to you, and I will not let go of you until you bless me. See, he finally got to where he was no longer being wrestled by God. Now he was wrestling with God, and now it's like you are the only one who can truly bless me. 
this is what I should have done 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I should have been wrestling with you. You shouldn't have had to chase me for 20 years. You shouldn't have had to wrestle me in the middle of the night. I should have been wrestling you in the middle of the night. And if I had wrestled with you 20 years ago, I wouldn't have had to deceive my brother because you'd have given me a blessing far and above that which I could have ever imagined. God has been wrestling with many of us for a very long time. And I think it's time now for us to begin wrestling with him. Because when you wrestle with God and you will not let him go, he's going to ask you the same question that he asked Jacob that night. You will not let me go. What is your name? I am Jacob. See, you know what he... See, he's asking us the same question that he's asking Jacob. Let me rephrase that a little bit. What he really is asking you is, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? I am Jacob. No, you're not. Because you have finally wrestled with me, you are no longer Jacob. You are now Israel. You are a prince who has power with God. And this you know, I am with you. And when he came to his brother, his brother fell on him and wept on him. They could not abide together. They were too different. But for that one day, they were able to make peace. And then finally, they were able to separate in peace. Right now, God is wrestling with many of us. If we will wrestle with him, he's going to basically ask us the question, who are you? Who do you think you are? And after we're done telling him who we think we are, that's when he's going to tell us finally, no, hear who is who you really are. So I want to encourage each and every one of you do not do not let another moment pass you by. Don't be distracted by the, by the moment. Don't be distracted by anything. Don't make God come wrestle you. Follow after him and wrestle him. And he is going to show you who you are and give you a blessing much greater than that which you can ever imagine. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for your love to us, that you chase us when we run, that you wrestle with us until we wrestle with you, that you make us look at ourselves and ask ourselves who we are and tell you who we think who we have believed ourselves to be, who others have called us, who our own lives have made us. But then you do what only you can do, and you make us who we were always meant to be. Lord, let each and every one in the sound of my voice begin to wrestle with you until the moment that they finally realize who you are and who you've made them to be. Lord, we thank you for this. We praise you for this. We glorify you for this. Be glorified. Show us who we are and bless us beyond measure.
and we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.